Okay, welcome everyone. My name's Michael Downey and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on Does Rootstock Performance Change with Age? Uh, I'd also like to welcome today's presenter, uh, Tim Pitt, a research scientist at Saudi Water Resources. Now Tim's a field-based researcher within the South Australian Research and Development Institute and he's worked across many of South Australia's irrigation districts exploring methods to improve the productivity and quality of perennial horticultural crops irrigated with saline waters. His current suite of projects focuses on rootstock longevity in both viticulture and citrus, as well as characterising the salt sensitivity of almond trees. Now in this webinar, Tim will discuss the sustained performance of rootstocks in lower Murray vineyards. Uh, but before I hand over to Tim to get us started, a couple of quick notes on what to expect for anyone that's new to AWRI webinars. Um, the format for today is a very short 20 minute style presentation and that'll be followed by a Q&A. Um, we encourage attendees to get involved and interact. Um, so to ask a question, please type into the questions pane of your control panel in the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, for those with access to a microphone or for anyone that's dialed in, there's also the option of speaking, speaking with us directly by clicking the raise hand button. Uh, this is located in the top left section of your control panel. Um, questions will be asked, answered at the end of the session, but um, feel free to send through your questions at any stage. Uh, just finally, if you want to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. Okay, so that's enough from me for now. I'm now going to hand over to Tim to get us started. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, yes, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about a suite of trials that have been conducted over the last few years focusing on rootstock performance and more specifically in recent times trying to chase down the question of uh, age and the influence that age has on the performance of different rootstock genotypes. Uh, so currently we're oper operating under a project that's got support through the South Australian River Murray Sustainability Program that's administered by PERSA. Um, we've had good collaboration with uh, Accolade Wines in terms of getting some juice maturity assessments done and various regional uh, grape and wine bodies. And we've had generous support over many decades now from individual irrigators who have been managing our field trials under commercial growing conditions. So uh, particular thanks to them. So initially, just a, a quick introduction as to where we're going this morning. Um, I'll give you a bit of background to the work that we've been doing over the years and our research question and general approach um, before giving you a snapshot of some of the results that we've uh, gathered recently, particularly in terms of longevity of production, some of the salt exclusion characteristics and uh, drought tolerance as well, uh, before giving you a quick summary and a where to from here. So. As a background, um, Saudi's predecessor, the old uh, SA Department of Ag, through the uh, 1970s, 80s and 90s, planted out multiple generations of fully replicated rootstock trials across many um, wine regions through South Australia, so seven regions in, uh, in total. Uh, more than 50 rootstock field trials were planted out. Uh, and the distribution of those is, is seen in that map on the right hand side where the, the numbers in brackets represent the number of different trials in that particular region. So obviously the Riverland with 38 field trials is the most dense concentration of rootstock trials and it's largely because it's, there's such a high dependence of rootstocks in that region. But there are other uh, rootstock trials distributed through the rest of the state as well. So more than 50 rootstock trials were planted. Um, over 10 sign varieties, 30 or more uh, rootstock genotypes, which means that currently we now have over 50 uh, fully replicated trials around the, the state uh, in excess of 23 years, some of them into their 40th plus years of, of age. 
Most of them were planted out with um, help from the GWRDC, the Philoxera Board, and a lot of influence from the Riverland Environment Improvement uh, Group as well, and uh, ex-colleagues from the SA Department of Ag. So of those 50 that were planted out, um, 37 of them had um, assessments in their first few years of life. Um, and many of those parameters measured included yield, uh, fruit maturity, uh, colour density of juice, the iron composition of some of those juices, and for some vineyards as well, there were bigger assessments done. And all of those data are reported in a, a publication called Grapevine Rootstock Trials in South Australia that was put out by Phil Nicholas of SARDI. And he also built a, a summary uh, recommendation table that was published in an old grape grower and winemaker um, journal in 1997 which many growers have since been using as the basis for their planting decisions. Um, but most of those recommendations were based on uh, learnings from young rootstock trials or importing knowledge from greenhouse trials or overseas research as well. So none of it's actually based on local conditions of, of older vines and that's the gap that this work is trying to address. So our, our research question predominantly is focusing on the long-term performance of these vines. So how are they going now that they're in their 20, 30, 40 year plus um, age bracket? Are they still behaving the same way that they were in their first 10 years of life? Um, and our approach is to revisit these historic rootstock trials, um, look at the long-term yield and quality attributes, and wherever possible uh, measure those against the historic data sets, and then see if we can determine before performance as affected by age or whether its effects are dependent on rootstock or maybe we'll even see interactions with sign or location. So let's look at some of the results we've um, pulled in over the last few years, that starting with the longevity of production, so yield predominantly. This first slide describes the performance of a Shiraz vineyard down in the limestone coast. It was planted in Kunawara in 1986. It had its first assessment done at ages three to six years. And then we were able to go back there in 2010 and 11, age 24, 25, to see how um, things were behaving 20 odd years later. Um, the graph is showing yield performance, so kilograms per vine on the y-axis and then the various rootstock combinations down here on the X, starting with own roots over on the left, and then quite an odd rootstock in Petit Vido, um, on the far right. It was planted out as a vigor reducing trial initially. And even within th the first three to six years, you can see that although most of them are quite even, these pale bars are all fairly even, Petit Vido is starting to drop off already. Uh, and looking at the vine, it is a very narrow, uh, rootstock and quite a constricted union, uh, a lot of benching with the scion above. The reason I'm showing you this image is uh, more the, the difference in shapes between the grey bars and the, the dark red bars. So dark red were the yield performance when we came back 24, at age 24, 25. And while they're all fairly stable early in the vineyard's life, and there's no great standout amongst most of the, the rootstock combinations, when it comes to later in life, the yield rankings change dramatically. Um, some of them increase in their production, some of them decrease in their production. Uh, and the question that came to mind when we first saw this was, well, how does this happen with rootstocks in other districts? Most importantly, in districts that rely heavily on rootstocks, such as those up in the Riverland. Um, and through the River Murray Corridor. If, uh, if we're getting change in yield, such a basic fundamental parameter as yield from a rootstock combination in a region like the Riverland, then that's going to be important for planning decisions. And maybe we can't just rely on the young information we need to look at the performance of older vines. And so that was the question we took to the Psalms uh, program and we were fortunate to get support to to look at uh, some of the rootstock trials planted through the River Murray Corridor. And while this, I'm sorry, is a, a very busy slide, it's basically trying to condense of the 40 odd trials that were available to us in the Riverland and down in Langhorne Creek, 18 were deemed to be suitable for uh, revisiting for assessment. We took that to the local uh, wine and grape groups and the Viditech groups and various growers and we got a 
a hierarchy of important sites to revisit and we narrowed it down and ultimately over the last two years we've revisited 13 of those 18 sites. Um, most of them have now got an additional two seasons worth of yield and fruit quality parameter data. Some of them have some salt exclusion parameters collected as well. So I'll show you some of the, um, the yield trends from, from those 13, not, not all. Uh, this first one is a, a Cabernet block planted in Berry in 1993. It's a 10 rep trial, multiple rootstocks. You'll notice there's no own roots here and many of the Riverland trials don't have own roots as a comparator, um, simply because in the early generations those were the vines that died off first, um, often because of nematodes or some other replant disorder. So own roots in subsequent generations were dropped out and we only had um, uh, rootstock, we only had grafted vines being compared. Again, we're seeing the grey bars being the early yield data, reasonably even, perhaps a difference between a J series rootstock and a, and a Ramsey. But when we look at the, um, the yield rankings most recently, over the last two years at age 22, 23, we see a change, a change in the ranking score across all of these with uh, Ramsey, K5140 and Taliki all dropping off significantly over the last 20 odd years in their yield performance. Um, little change with many of the others. It's worth pointing out that this uh, y-axis, they are quite high yields, which is typical for the region. They are being pushed for yield and it's at this upper yield limit that we're seeing these differences. So they're still producing, producing reasonable tonnages, but there's a, a real drop off from what they had early in their life. At a similar trial just down the road in Barmara, this is a Shiraz planted in, planted in 1993. Uh, again, the J series started off quite low. They weren't as precocious as some of the other rootstock combinations. You can see these grey bars of J69 and 48 being lower than the others. Um, but then more recently in 2015-16 at age 22-23, everything's dropped off whereas the J1769 and the J1748 have been stable. So they've been honest producers over the last 20 years. Ramsey and 140 Ruggieri, even though they're still producing high tonnages now, are significantly lower than what was measured in the first few years of their lives. And they were what the planning decisions, that's the information that recommendations are being made on. If we're looking at a Shiraz trial down in Langhong, Creek. This was planted in 92. In this case, we do have own roots. The tonnages are a lot lower than what was reported up in the Riverland. We haven't got quite as many rootstock combinations to compare against, but this is a highly replicated trial. There's 17 reps here, uh, which was valuable because early in the life of these grey bars representing early yields, the own roots was quite variable with significant year-to-year -year shifts. Um, when we averaged out years five to eight, this is the, the trends that we got and the more recent yield um, numbers are matching very closely with those early, early yield trends. So we've got very little change in the yield rankings at this site at a, at a lower producing block. Production at year 23, 24 was lower than early in its life, but that could just as likely be related to the, um, the operational strategies of the manager as much as, as rootstocks. Cabernet at Langhorn Creek. In this case, we've got three time steps. Again, the most recent yield data is quite a lot lower than um, six to eight years or even 17 to 18 years of age. This block's a bit older. It's planted in 83 and it's currently coming into its 34th season. Um, while the trends are the same, uh, vines grafted to 110 Richter, Taliki 5C and Ramsey are all significantly higher than the own roots. Of those grafted three, it was only really Ramsey that had a, a lower fruit quality or a lower maturity, um, lower maturity in terms of Brix pH and TA, uh, lower colour density compared to own roots or the other grafted vines and lower tannin concentration as well. It's arguable that if um, Ramsey, uh, if Cab Sav on Ramsey and Langhorn Creek were planted out as a single block rather than as, than it, as this mixed patch, you'd be able to manage it to uh, return the type of quality that is desirable. These vines were all harvested on the same day just before the commercial harvest date. So Ramsey was a little bit further behind. 
An interesting side story for this particular block was that um, in 2015, when we were there collecting our yield, doing our yield assessments, we realised there was quite a high incidence of bunch stem necrosis and it was prevalent throughout the district in Cabernet. Uh, we were able to modify our um, harvest strategies and assess the rootstock effect on the BSN. If you look at that left column initially, you can see the total bunch count from all of our vines. Um, and then the middle column shows the incidence of bunch stem uh, necrosis with Ramsey particularly, but also 110 Richter being significantly lower than, than the others, only 12.5% for Ramsey. And that ultimately led to uh, a far greater uh, volume of deliverable fruit um, from vines grafted to 110 Richter and vines grafted to Ramsey as compared to own roots or the other grafted. So that was a, a bit of a surprise for, for Ramsey particularly because high vigor vines have previously been shown to be susceptible to, to BSN, but that wasn't the case in, in this year at Langon Creek. So a bit of an introduction to the salt exclusion properties at some of our, our trial sites. This, this data relates to a Shiraz property in the Riverland. It was planted in 96. Um, in itself, it's, it's a fairly tricky block. It's quite a skeletal, calcareous, sandy loam soil. It's not typical of most of the vineyards in the Riverland. What it does have, though, uh, multiple, rootstocks, uh, multiple rootstock trials planted on the same site. And while we didn't do full assessments at this site, we did go back and look at the salt um, characteristics of, of various rootstocks here because the, the soil has been saline in its time. There is still salt in the soil now. Um, and we do have uh, some historic uh, salinity information to look back at and compare. So this site receives around seven or eight meg of non-saline irrigation water. Early in the piece, in the early 2000s, the soil salinity was hovering around four deci siemens on average, as indicated by these soil traces up the top, year on year on year. It received about 210 mils of rain, um, sporadic rain. It was the beginning of the drought period. Um, Whereas more recently when we came in and collected our soil salinities, the, the undervine soil salinity was quite low, certainly below the yield decline threshold of 2.1 decisiemens. The recent rains ahead of that in the 2011 to 2015 period had been higher, with some of those years being very high. Um, and when we measured our soil salinity in the mid-row, that's when we found where the, soil was, the salt was sitting. It's certainly quite saline in the mid-row at the moment. Um, and these vines are still at risk of drinking saline soil water should that salt be flushed towards the, the undervine soils. We collected pediol tissue at flowering over the last couple of years and we compared um, those numbers to what was measured in 2004 when the soil was quite saline. In between then and now, soil salinities have reduced. And for most of um, the rootstock combinations, the sodium content in the PTL has been stable or reducing. But for Taliki 5C and for 110 Richter, it's actually increased over time. The same for the PTL chloride. The Taliki 5C has increased its um, presentation of chloride in, in the PTL tissue despite soil salinities dropping over that period. How that translates to the juice sodium and the juice chloride, most of them are fairly um, equal, but again, the Taliki 5C is above all the others in presentation of juice sodiums and juice chlorides. This is average of 2015-16 data. Unfortunately, the historic data is incomplete. I've not shown it um, in this slide. So that elevated salt and PDL have certainly been reflected in the juice sodium and chlorides. We have got other rootstock trials at this site that we are also working our way through to see if this is consistent across the other varieties at the site. We've also got other um, trials throughout the Riverland that have historic um, salt information. One of the more interesting one, ones is this 38-year-old Columbard vineyard in Loxton. These plots show the juice sodium and the juice chloride collected at age four to six years. On the far left of each plot is the own roots value, and on the far right is the taliki. And when We've gone back and collected our pediol um, measures at age 38. Our own roots is showing reasonably high levels of chloride. And again, our taliki is at the upper end for our grafted vines. So taliki is certainly um, 
showing a propensity to express salt and certainly is standing up alongside some of the earlier recommendations by Phil Nicholas as a, as a rootstock that's sensitive to salinity and one to avoid <clears throat> if you're expecting salt pressure. In terms of the drought tolerance, we looked at a, a Chardonnay rootstock trial in the Riverland. It was planted in 93 and it had eight rootstocks. Um, it was fully irrigated from 93 through to 2008, but at this point, with prices being what they were at the time for Chardonnay and the allocations being so low, low and the, um, the, the price of water being so high, it just wasn't possible for the grower to keep irrigating these vines and so irrigation was ceased for, from 2008 onwards and ultimately the grower decided to bulldoze the vines in November 2010. So that was a two-year period where those vines were growing without irrigation. And this table down below shows that the average rainfall early in their life at 210 with a full irrigation and then between 2008 and 2010 um, we had about 290 mils of average rainfall but effectively zero irrigation. That 15 mils was only applied at the end of the, the two year period in order to help remove posts and vines when the, when the uh, block was grubbed. This image over here shows the water content um, in 2004 or 2003 under full irrigation um, as compared to uh, the, irrigation, uh, the soil water content later in life which is close to permanent wilting point. So when we got there in October 2010 and we're seeing these sad dry vines, these vines effectively represent what we saw from each of the, um, the rootstock combinations, Chardonnay on each of these rootstocks. Many of the vines were actually dead. Um, I don't show those in, the, in these photos. So um, the Ramsey here, they were predominantly all looking quite lush and green and although they weren't looking as healthy as they could, they certainly were um, persisting quite well, as were the 140 ridge areas. But then we get a, a whole other group of, of rootstocks that were backing off significantly and in terms of mortality where there were a lot more vines that were actually dead, you could see at this J1748 end, 60% of them were actually dead, which was assessed as being no, no green growth at all, no shoots at all. We were able to assess the difference in shoot dry weights and inflorescence counts between the full irrigation time and the, and the vines after they'd been zero irrigated for years. If you have a look at the dry shoot initially, um, obviously here is under irrigation. Each of these rootstocks performed quite well. They were fairly well equivalent apart from one thing really, which was the lower vigor. Two years of zero irrigation, we can see they've all reduced in their dry shoot weight. Um, k 5140s virtually collapsed, 1103Ps almost collapsed. Um, 110 Richter, which started off a little bit slow, has had a fairly low relative decline comparing to uh, 1103P and K5140 and Ramsey also did, did quite well, so they're showing reasonable shoot weights despite two years of zero irrigation. If we're looking at the inflorescence counts, um, again under full irrigation conditions when there was no stress at all, the inflorescence counts were equivalent, no problem in producing fruit when there's no stress. But after two years of zero irrigation, some of our vines are showing significant decline. 1103P has collapsed, K5140 has collapsed. 110 Richter has stood up okay, as has Ramsey. So rootstocks that have high inflorescence counts, counts under a no stress situation don't necessarily um, display that when the, the water's turned off after two years. Some of them stood up okay, some didn't. And the interesting story here is that 1103P and K5140 have previously been highlighted as being drought tolerant rootstocks. Um, so what we're seeing um, partway through this process of reassessing vine performance as they, as they age is that some of the recommendations that were developed early in their lives are being challenged, such as 1103 being drought tolerant, we certainly didn't see that. And some of them are being confirmed, such as 5C Taliki being a salt sensitive rootstock. So what we're hoping to do through the duration of this piece of work in, in pulling together the last few um, juice analysis um, and, and yield analysis is to try and see are there any other challenges that need to be made to this recommendation table? Can we refine it to make it of greater value to districts such as the Riverland where rootstocks are quite important for their production? 
So to summarise what we've got so far, with a bit more collation and analysis to go, we have seen that yes, rootstocks can affect the yield with age. We've seen that at multiple regions and multiple scions. We've shown again that Taliki 5C is a poor excluder of sodium and chloride. We've shown that Ramsey and 110 Richter are drought tolerant rootstocks and that what's not shown here is that 1103P and 140 Ruggieri are, are not drought tolerant. We've also seen that Ramsey and 110 Richter are less susceptible to bump stem necrosis. So where are we going from here? Um, right now we're conducting presence absence tests, vine health tests through all of the vineyards, whether we visited them for yield assessments and quality assessments or not. Just seeing, um, trying to get a measure of longevity of uh, survivability. And we're doing that right now. We've still got completion of plant tissue and juice chemistry to run through. And we've got to collate all of that into a usable format initially in the in uh, a final report, but ultimately in, into formats that are going to be usable for, for our, our vine growers. Um, and we've got multiple trial sites in other regions as well uh, that are available as a resource if, if industry is interested. So thank you for the opportunity of uh, sharing our initial results. I'm more than happy to take any questions and my, my contact details are there if uh, you'd like to get in touch. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much for that, Tim. Um, and as Tim's just indicated, he's going to stick around and take any questions you've got. So please start sending uh, your questions through now if you have any. Um, just a reminder. <coughs> excuse me. Just a reminder. Um, you can type your questions in, and you can do that at the bottom um, section of your control panel, and just click to send through. Um, if you've got a microphone or you've dialed in on a phone um, and you want to chat directly with Tim, just uh, click the raise hand button, which is in the left uh, section, top left section of your control panel. Uh, so we don't have any questions just at this stage, um, but look, Tim will stick around for um, another 30 seconds to a minute or so to see if we get any come through. Um, in the meantime, just a quick reminder about the next AWRI webinar. Uh, that'll be next Thursday, um, 27th of October, and we've got the AWRI Simon Nordiskard who's going to present on hot extraction uh, tool to manage compressed vintages. Okay, looks like we're not going to get any questions for today, so we'll finish there. Um, so I'd just like to firstly thank Tim for uh, coming and presenting today. i also like to thank everyone who attended and took part in the session. Uh, for all attendees, you will receive a follow-up email. Uh, this email will contain a link to the recording of today's session and there'll also be a link to a survey. Um, as I mentioned, the next AWRI webinar is on hot extraction um, by Simon Nordisgaard. If you haven't registered for this and you'd like to, please visit the AWRI website. Uh, so that's all we have for today. Thank you again for attending and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.